Okay, so I, I'd like to begin by uh, thanking Nawa and the other organizers for uh, inviting me. You know, it's my great pleasure to come here and uh, um, to speak in this uh, really fascinating meeting and also take a break from t my teaching in Colorado. <laughs> so, now this diagram shows you a membrane protein on the cell surface. Now these proteins are the windows and the doors of the cell. Now these proteins include receptors, um, channels, and the transporters. And they allow the cell to uh, communicate with the outside environment. Now as you can imagine, the surface levels of these proteins must be precisely controlled. Now too much of a protein, or too little of a protein, can often disrupt the physiological pathway associated with the protein. And in humans, this may often cause diseases. Um, so here I can give you uh, one example many of you already know. Um, now if you have two high levels activate EGF receptors on the cell surface, this is going to cause uncontrolled proliferation of the cells, and this may cause cancer. Now on the other hand, if you have two low level of a glucose transporter, as you're going to see uh, in a moment, uh, this is going to disrupt uh, blood glucose homeostasis. And in humans, this may cause type 2 diabetes. Now, how is the surface level of proteins determined? It's determined by the balance of exocytosis and the endocytosis. Now, exocytosis is a vesicle fusion event, which involves the fusion of exocytic vesicle with the plasma membrane. And this delivers the cargo to the plasma membrane. Endocytosis, on the, on the other hand, removes the cargo from the plasma membrane and returns it to the endocytic uh, compartments. Now, remarkably, both exocytosis and the endocytosis can be regulated by stimulus. And the, in this way, the surface level of a membrane protein can be adjusted acutely according to uh, physiological demands. And uh, here, a stimulus could be a second messenger. It could be a uh, phosphorylations. Now, a major model system we have been using to study uh, surface <coughs> protein homeostasis uh, is insulin-controlled GUL4 translocation. Now, GUL4 is quite an euro glucose transporter because under con uh, the basal condition, GUL4 is sequestered in the intracellular compartment, so it's not on the plasma membrane. And now this is because your blood sugar level is normal, and you don't need to uptake glucose. And at this basal stage, uh, the exocytosis and the endocytosis is at the equilibrium. So now imagine uh, you have food, so your blood sugar goes up, and this triggers insulin secretion from the pancreas which then traveled in the bloodstream and reached the target tissues, mostly adipocytes and the skeletal muscles. Now, when insulin binds to the receptor on the plasma membrane, this activates insulin signaling cascade, which eventually leads to the activation of exocytosis. At the same time, the endocytosis is moderately reduced. And the result is a translocation of GUL4 uh, protein from vesicle to the cell surface. And this uh, translocation allows the transporter to uptake glucose into the cell, either burning into ATP or storage. Now this is your blood glucose level after you uh, have food. Now time zero is the time you have a meal. Now you can see your blood glucose level quickly goes up, but also it rapidly returns to the normal range. And this uh, returning to the normal range is driven by insulin stimulated GUL4 translocation. And when your blood glucose returns to the normal range, insulin signaling terminates. And this also shuts down exocytosis. At the same time, endocytosis resumes. And this leads to the retrieval of GUL4 from cell surface and the returning them to the vesicles. Now you can see uh, insulin controlled the surface level of GUL4 uh, transporters 
by regulating exocytosis and the endocytosis. Now, as much as we uh, uh, love GUD4 exocytosis, the major goal we studied is to use as a paradigm to establish the general principles of surface protein homeostasis. Uh, for example, we expect our findings can be extended to understand the trafficking of neurotransmitter uh, receptors uh, in the neurons, uh, the transport of water channels in the kidney epithelial cells, and the trafficking of immune receptors <coughs> in the immune system. Now today I'm going to tell you uh, two stories on the regulation of surface protein homeostasis. I'm going to begin by a short story on the regulation of RAP GTPs by a protein called RAPF in the exocytosis. Then I'm going to focus on a very recent finding on the regulation of AP2 adapter formation uh, by a gap in the endocytosis. So I'll begin with the exocytosis. Exocyt exocytosis, as I mentioned, is a vesicle fusion event. Now this is uh, after RAB and the tether bring the vesicle and the target membrane together. And the vesicle fusion is uh, driven by two classes of molecules, snares and the second one monkating SM protein. Now snares are membrane-anchored proteins. And uh, you have a vesicle-anchored snare, called a V-snare, and a target-anchored snare, called the T-snares. When the V-snare and the T-snare see each other, they spontaneously assemble into a so-called transnare complex. And the transnare assembly proceeds toward the membrane. So you can imagine this is like a, a zippering process, which forces the two membranes into a close proximity to fuse. Now, SM protein is a soluble protein. It can bind to the transnare complex and accelerate the transnare assembly. Now, snares and SM protein, they're the core engine for vesicle fusion. In addition to this core engine, GUL4 exocytosis also requires specialized regulator regulatory factors, such as the SNP, Thomason, and the DOC2B. Uh, our previous work focused on biochemical dissection of these molecules. Since most of the work has already been uh, published, uh, here I'm not going into uh, details. And from, from here, I'd like to mention uh, this protein, I believe, only represent a minor fraction of the entire regulatory network for GUL4 exocytosis. Now, the sequencing of the human genome predicted a large number of membrane proteins. Um, and for the majority of these membrane protein, we know virtually nothing. So therefore, I think uh, the most important uh, uh, direction in the field is to comprehensively identify new regulators for GUL4 exocytosis. Um, our quest coincided with uh, advanced CRISPR-Cas9 genome editing. So we decided to perform unbiased genome-wide CRISPR screens. So we took advantage of existing genome-wide CRISPR libraries, but also we make our own uh, customer CRISPR libraries. In these CRISPR libraries, um, uh, this, so these are all lentivirus-based. You have a single guide RNA and also the Cas9. The single guide RNA recruits Cas9 protein to specific uh, location in the genome to introduce loss of function mutations. And the two perform screens, we uh, um, use a HAGIP GUL4 reporter. Now this reporter has a HA epitope inserted into extracellular domain. Now HA staining, as you can see here, uh, can stain the surface GUL4 reporters. On the other hand, the GIP tells you the total protein in the cell. Now if we calculate HA staining and uh, uh, GIP staining, this will give you the information about the relative amount of uh, GUL4 reporter on the cell surface. And we start a stable cell line expressing this GUL4 reporter, and we mutagenize using the uh, CRISPR-Cas9 library, and then we treat the cell with the insulin. And then we use the flow cytometry to sort for the cells with the low GUL4 on the cell surface. And then we repeat the process for three times. 
And then we took the sorted population and recovered the single guide RNAs and used the deep sequencing to analyze uh, the abundance of the single guide RNAs. Then we use the bioinformatic tools to uh, calculate the significant hits. And finally, we performed secondary screens and the individual validations. So we perform a screen in uh, multiple cell lines. Uh, we start a uh, proof of concept screened in the cancer cell lines, but eventually we focus on myoblast and uh, pre adipocytes uh, So very briefly, our screen uh, identified a large number of single guide RNAs that were significantly enriched compared to the control population. So we then use this equation to calculate the abundance of the single guide RNAs so we can derive significant hits from the screens. Well, the screens identify a larger number of genes. The majority of the hits were not previously, previously linked to glu 4 exocytosis. But we did recover known regulators, such as REP10, exocyst, and almost the entire insulin signaling cascade. So here I'm going to focus on one new factor identified in the screen called the RIBF. Now RIBF, RAB interacting factor, it's a very small protein. It's a 14 kD soluble protein. Now when I uh, did a sequence analysis, the only prediction was it's a putative guanine nucleotide exchange factor for RABs, or GAP for RABs. Now now well, you're probably going to, well I think I remember you told me uh, you didn't believe uh, RIBF was a GAP from the very beginning, but I have to say, uh, it's kind of ahead of the field because if you search literature and uh, uh, search the motifs, this is the only information you got. The entire protein is a rib GAF, of course, a putative GAF. Now, what's a GAF? Um, RAB GTPs is involved in the vesicle tethering, and the RAB is a G protein. And the RAB cycled between GTP and the GDP bound form and the GTP bound form is active. And what GAF does is to promote GTP binding. So GAF is a positive, is a positive regulator uh, for RAB. Now the story of RABF began um, 25 years ago with two papers published by Peter Novick and the Pietro Dicamidis groups. Uh, so their papers were mostly based on in vitro biochemical assays and actually, uh, RIBF is also known as MS4 or DSS4. This is the first putative GAF for RIB GTPs. Now think about that. There are about 70 RIB GTPs in the human genome, and this protein is the first uh, putative GAF. But uh, surprisingly, decades later, its biologic function was still unknown. And next, we use the CRISPR-Cas9 knockout uh, RIBF in adipocytes. And in the wild type cell, you here you can see uh, insulin strongly promote GUL4 reporter translocation to the cell surface. So all these are flow cytometry-based uh, analysis. But in the RIBF knockout cells, you can see uh, uh, the translocation was largely abolished. And this <laughs> confirmed uh, the screen data. Now these are exocytosis, I say. Uh, if you look at the slope of the curves, this represents the speed of exocytosis. And you can see uh, here in the RIBF knockout cells, exocytosis was uh, strongly reduced. And we could uh, fully rescue the exocytosis by uh, uh, introducing the wild-type RIBF gene. And these are confocal uh, images images which also confirm the flow cytometry data. In the wild type cells, you can see uh, insulin relocate uh, GUL4 reporter from intracellular compartment to the cell surface. Uh, so I want to point out these are uh, lipid droplets, uh, well, adipocytes, not the nucleus. And uh, here is the, uh, the boundary of the cells. Uh, in contrast, in the RIBF knockout cells, you can see uh, insulin stimulate GUL4 translocation was uh, largely abolished. And here I want to make an important point. It's, uh, 
discovery of the first the physiological function of RIBF finally makes it possible to explore its molecular mechanism. Now, since RIBF is known as a RIB binding protein, the first question we ask, what's a RIB target? Now, if we uh, uh, look at the screen again, RIBF was identified in the same screen as RIB10, which is a known regulator of uh, uh, GLUT4 exocytosis. So we speculate maybe RIBF controls GLUT4 exocytosis by binding to RIB10. And the first, we uh, prepare the recombinant protein and the test if these two proteins bind to each other. And this is the in vitro liposome co-flotation assay. And here we anchored RIB10 protein in the proteoliposomes. Then we add a soluble RIBF to the liposome. And after centrifugation, the liposome migrate to the top of the gradient together with the bonded protein. Then we collect this fraction and analyze by SDS page. Okay, so here I just want you to focus on this line. You can see a uh, RIB10 protein could bind to RIBF in the co-flotation assay, and the binding appear to be a uh, stoichiometric. By contrast, protein-free liposome could not uh, bind any RIBF protein. So RIBF bind to RIB10 directly. And since RIBF is known as a putative GAF, we ask, can RIBF function as a, a RIB10 GAF? The structure of RIBF with a RIB10 is still not known, but we do have the structure of the complex with RIB8, which is a kind of related RIB. Now based on this structure, we, uh, uh, we found that there are several residues at the binding interface. So therefore, we introduce mutations, either single allele mutation or triple mutations, to disrupt the interaction. And this is the in vitro GDP release assay, which is commonly used to analyze RIB GAFs. Now, without the RIBF, you can see almost no change. But when we added the wild type RIBF, you can see a rapid uh, GDP release. And when we introduce the, uh, the mutant, either a single mutant or the uh, triple allele mutant, you can see uh, the GDP release rate was strongly reduced. Now, if you look at the initial rate of the triple mutation, uh, we estimate about a 20-fold drop in the, uh, uh, in the GTP release. So here came as a surprise. When we introduced these mutants into a RIBF knockout cells, we found that these GAF mutants can rescue the GLUT4 exocytosis to the same level as the wild-type gene. And we repeated experiments in uh, multiple cell types, several different conditions. We always got the same results. And this, these data strongly suggest RIBF is actually not a GAF in GLUT4 exocytosis. Now, if, if a RIBF is not a GAF, what's the biological function? And here came another surprise. When we look at a RIBF, uh, RIB10 expression in RIB, RIBF knockout cells, we found that the protein disappeared, okay? And we could uh, rescue RIB10 expression using either the wild type or the two mutant uh, RIBF. So the rescue of RIB10 expression uh, correlate with the ability of this protein to rescue GLUT4 exocytosis and has nothing to do with their in vitro GAF activities. So therefore, we propose RIBF functions by stabilizing RIB10 protein in GUL4 exocytosis. Now to test this possibility, we um, uh, also tried uh, lentiviral expression of RIB10 in the knockout cells. Now this work is important because we had to rule out RIBF doesn't control the transcription or epigenetic regulation of RIB10 expression. So here we uh, we found we could readily express RIB10 in the wild type cells, but very little protein was observed in the RIBF knockout cells. And these data are consistent with uh, um, uh, the previous data I just showed you and the supported idea RIBF stabilized RIB10 protein. 
And when we treat the RabbitF knockout cells with MG132, which is a proteasome inhibitor, uh, we found uh, we could uh, fully rescue RAP10 expression. And when we treat uh, MG, the cells with uh, both MG132 and uh, cyclohexamide, which is a protein translation inhibitor, the rescue was abolished. Now this data suggests without RabbitF, RAP10 protein could be e efficiently produced but they're quickly degraded without uh, the function of a RABF. Now here we propose two models. It's possible RABF stabilize uh, intrinsic, intrinsically unstable RAP10 intermediate. So therefore it's more like a chaperone. On the other hand, it's also possible RABF can protect the folded RAP10 protein from proteasome degradation for example, by masking uh, so-called uh, diagrams. To distinguish between these two models, we uh, reconstitute RAP10 and the RAPF into E. coli cells. E. coli, as you know, doesn't have any RAPs or RAPF. Uh, so we found RAP10 protein could be produced in the E. coli without RAPF, but all the protein end up in the insoluble pellets. We couldn't get any protein from the supernatant. We could uh, extract soluble rep protein only when RabF was uh, co-expressed. So therefore, RabF stabilized an uh, unstable uh, rep intermediate. And uh, without RabF, rep is going to aggregate in E. coli and then misfold and get uh, degraded by the proteasome in the uh, mammalian cells. And this supports the idea RabF is a molecular chaperone for RAP10, not a GAF. So here I called it a HODIS chaperone because it's a different from uh, uh, the classical chaperones like HSP70, HSP90. Both require ATP dependent cycles, uh, but the RABF is a small protein, it's not ATPs. Instead, it recognizes the substrate and stabilizes the protein, uh, which promotes its folding. And then we performed the mass spike analysis. We identified two additional RAP protein, RAP13 and RAP8, uh, also regulated by RAPF. And this is our model. Um, RAPF as a chaperone, they interact with the substrate and uh, stabilize these proteins, which promote the folding of these RAP GTPs into the native conformation. So therefore, they can promote exocytosis. And without RABF, the RABs cannot adopt native conformation. They get degraded by the proteasome. A brief summary. Uh, we identified the first biological function of RABF, which enabled us to uh, uh, discover the unexpected function of uh, uh, RABF in the GTP, RAB GTPS regulation. Because all the RAB GTPs function in a similar way, we expect maybe this Hodes Shepard model can also be applied to other RAB GTPs. Okay, let's return to this diagram. Uh, the surface level of membrane proteins determined by the balance of exocytosis and the endocytosis. Now, having talked about exocytosis, I'm going to focus on endocytosis. Yeah, go ahead. Well, yeah. I'm still at it. Uh, look, I mean, um, is this a chaperone for RABs under steady state conditions, or do cells have to go through something for this chaperone to be? Um, not in GUL4 exocytosis, but uh, I, I think that's an interesting point. Let's come back to yeast. This protein is conserved in yeast. It was cloned first in the yeast, but uh, when you knock out a protein, there is no phenotype. So at a normal condition, it's not uh, essential for yeast. But uh, what I imagine is uh, maybe uh, during stress condition, this protein is uh, recruited uh, to a trafficking, a trafficking pathway and it becomes essential. But in GUL4 exocytosis, uh, you always need it. Does it bind to both GTP bound or yeah. GDP bound? Uh, so we, we didn't address that, but according to the known structure with the RAB8, it's actually bind to the nucleotide free form. Uh, 
which I think uh, suggest it bind to the more upstream uh, of the folding pathway. Uh, and so far, I don't think there is evidence showing it bind to the nucleotide bond form of RAP GTPs. Yeah. Is it a chaperone or a co-chaperone? Uh, so, at least they... It doesn't seem to bind ATP itself. Does no, it? no, it does. it's a very small protein. So what I can say is that this protein form direct complex, and it's uh, about a one-to-one -one ratio. And uh, if uh, there is any additional protein bound to the complex, we don't know yet. Yeah. Well, on this uh, universe, universality of this, uh, um, I have a lot of questions about that. Uh, first, these are, I presume these three are the only RAMs you've picked up. Right, so that's right. At least in the cell type we studied, these three RABs are only, are only proteins okay. uh, controlled by RABF. So the question is, are there other isoforms of uh, RABF uh, in, in cells that could explain yeah. the other ones? Right. And just a comment, uh, um, RABs are, are very nicely expressed in E. coli in generally. And, uh, and in my experience, uh, RABF is the only one that really is difficult. I haven't tested right, 10 or, 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 okay. or, or, yeah. or, or 13, but right. RAB8 of all the RABs that I expressed in E. coli was right. the only one that was very difficult to express. Mm. So my, my, my uh, uh, expectation would be that this is a very specialized thing for these three RABs that you're presenting right. there. Right. And, and, and the question then becomes, what's special about the structure? Right. So. I, I think I can, I can tell you something. Uh, so why I show this uh, work to a colleague in the group four field, and he said, uh, finally, there is explanation why they couldn't produce REP10 in E. coli. They had to produce it in the inside the cells. And to come back to your question, is there anything special about these three proteins? And uh, you know, I talked to people in the field, and there is no reason to believe they're special. And so you said that in other REPs could be expressed readily in the E. coli. But that doesn't really rule out that there is a bacteria chaperones that perform similar functions uh, promote the folding. Um, but again, it's, it's all open question. Can I just comment? Because yeah. First of all, I didn't say I don't believe, because I never say I don't believe, I don't think. <laughs> That's I don't not think. true. <laughs> That's I not don't true. believe in you God. You say you don't believe. <laughs> not in science. Oh, okay. Not in science. I just, I don't think. Because I had a reason, because I knew all this huh? data. Those only in writing. <laughs> what? You only say that in writing. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think, especially when, when I have data, it's because it was only shown to that GDP can be released, but not GDP can be uh, acquired, unlike other GIFs. And here I want to just make a, a suggestion that maybe what's um, similar in these three is maybe just about simple biochemistry of nucleotide affinity, affi their affinity to nucleotides. And nucleotide free is known to be not stable a state of all GTPases. So maybe these three... But that's also, that's a true for all the RAB GTPs, right? So nucleotide free RAB is unstable, I right? I know, but I'm saying maybe these three have the low aff lower affinity than all the other RABs to mm -hmm. GDP. to nucleotides, GDP. and maybe that's why they right. need this chaperone. I, I, I agree. I, I think uh, there are certainly many questions need to be addressed. So, yeah. yeah, so related to that, if you get rid of the gap AS160 for uh, for ten. So AS160 is a gap. Yeah, it's a gap. It yeah. still have an effect? You mean uh, the repeated the experiments yeah, in the gap knockouts? Uh, uh, you force the uh, RAP10 to be in the GDP. <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah that's a good idea. We haven't tested. Okay. So that could be the next step. Endocytosis. Yeah, so. <laughs> okay, so here we uh, perform a similar screen, and um, it's uh, largely the same, but I want to point out the difference. We, so here we didn't treat the cell with the insulin. We uh, uh, we sort for the cell with a high glu 4 reporter on the plasma membrane without the sti stimulation. And the idea here is that we're going to recover the mutant cells uh, defective in the endocytosis. Um, so the screen recovered known regulators of endocytosis, uh, such as AP2, 
uh, adapter subunits. I'm going to come back shortly. And uh, TPC 1D4 is this is actually a, a inhibitor for exocytosis. So not only the screen recovered endocytic regulators, they also can recover inhibitors of uh, exocytosis. But again, most of the genes were not previously known to be involved in the GUL4 endocytosis. So here I'm going to focus on one gene uh, called A gap. Uh, so before that, I want to mention uh, the screen recovered subunits of uh, AP2 adapter complex. Now, AP2 adapter is a tetramer, two large subunits, alpha and beta, and the one medium subunit, mu, and the one small subunit of sigma. Now, our screen identified MP AP2S1, which encodes the sigma subunit. We also identify AP2M1, which encodes the mu subunit. Uh, so we didn't recover the alpha subunit, which is actually expected because there are two genes, AP2A1 and AP, AP2A2. Genetic screens cannot recover redundant genes. And the, AP, the beta subunit is the same story. The AP2B1 encodes the beta subunit, but the gene can be fully rescued, I would say compensated by AP1B1. So we couldn't recover alpha and the beta. But the idea is fairly clear. Uh, we recovered AP2 adapter subunits. Now what's a gap? Now if uh, you ask uh, someone in the field, nobody have heard about this protein. <coughs> it's a 34 KD soluble protein. That's why some people you called it P34. Uh, alpha and the gamma adaptin binding protein. I'm going to come back to uh, the naming shortly. Now this is known as IRC6P in yeast, but uh, no phenotap in yeast. I'd like to mention A gap is frequently mutated in the human disease called the punctate palmoplantar uh, keratoderma (PPK). Now, this is the hyplo insufficiency uh, mutations, uh, which means just a one allele mutation. Given the phenotype, we see if both alleles are mutated, apparently the organism cannot survive. Now, this disease is characterized by the thickening of the palm and the sole skin. And of course, the cause of the disease uh, by AGAP mutation is still unclear. And this is because we still don't know how AGAP works. Again, we knock out the AGAP in adipocytes using CRISPR-Cas9. And you can see, uh, if you focus on the orange bars, uh, it causes constitutive translocation of the reporter to the cell surface. So therefore, insulin regulation is uh, disrupted. The reporter go to the cell surface even without stimulation. And we confirm the flow cytometry data by uh, confocal imaging. Again, these are wild type cells, wild type cells, GUL4 mostly in the intracellular compartment. But if you look at the A gap knockout cells, it's already on the cell surface. And the phenotype is very similar to AP2S1 knockout cells. And AP2S1, as you remember, encodes a subunit of the AP2 adapter. And next, we examined uh, the endocytosis of a cargo. So here is a measurement of endocytosis of the fluorescent labeled antibody uh, recognizing GUL4. Now, this is a very commonly used uh, assay for endocytosis in the field. Now, when we knock out a gap, you can see uh, endocytosis of the cargo was abolished. And the phenotype was at, at least as severe as AP2S1 knockout. And the transferrin receptor, it's a classic uh, endocytic cargo of cholesterol mediated endocytosis. When we knock out the A gap, there was a strong accumulation of the protein on the cell surface. And the phenotype was uh, fairly similar to AP2S1 knockout. Now, this data clearly showed A gap is essential to cholesterol mediated endocytosis. Now, I said uh, virtually nothing is known about this protein. The only hint came from uh, uh, East 2 hybrid screens, uh, I think probably two decades ago. Now, Scotty Robinson's group found A gap combined to alpha subunit in East 2 hybrid. However, we still don't know if this binding is a direct interaction 
or if uh, this interaction is uh, biological significant. Uh, next, we prepare the recombinant protein and the test uh, direct interaction. And this protein from E. coli, uh, we found the GST tag of our subunit indeed interact with a gap, and the GST itself couldn't. And the interaction here appeared to be a uh, stoichiometric. Now, how does a gap regulate AB2 uh, adapter formation? Um, there's just some background light, but hopefully you can see uh, in the wild type cells on the cell surface, there are abandoned uh, AP2, uh, thank you, uh, AP2 puncta on the cell surface. But uh, strikingly, when we knock out a gap, these puncta largely disappeared. And so this is accompanied by translocation of GLU4 reporter from intracellular compartment to the cell surface. And we confirm this confocal data by uh, a turf microscopy, which monitor the events near the plasma membrane. But ag so here again, in the wild type cells, we observed a large number of AP2 puncta, uh, but they all disappeared in the AAGAB knockout cells. And here I can imagine two possibilities. Maybe AAGAB is important for surface recruitment of AP2 adapter, or they could be essential for the stability of AP2 adapter. Well, it turned out the second possibility was correct. When we knock out a gap, you can see the alpha subunit largely disappeared. At the same time, the beta subunit was uh, strongly reduced, and the mu subunit was also abolished. Our antibody didn't work for sigma so far, but you can get the idea Without a gap, AP2 adapters were degraded. And of course, this is a highly reminiscent of a RIBF story I just told you. <coughs> so therefore, we uh, speculate that maybe a gap also stabilized the AP2 adapters. Since they bind to alpha sub subunit, maybe it's a chaperone for alpha subunit. And again, we reconstitute a gap and alpha subunit in E. coli which doesn't have RAB, which doesn't have a gap, which doesn't have class remediate endocytosis. Again, so here if you look at uh, the palate, this is after extraction, which represents an insoluble fraction. We could express the alpha subunit without a gap, but all the protein end up in the palate. We couldn't extract any protein in the supernatant. However, when we co-express a gap, now we could extract the protein in the supernatant. And this again is uh, similar to RebF in the Reb10 uh, story, which suggests the alpha subunit itself is uh, unstable. In bacteria, it's, uh, uh, it forms aggregates, and in mammalian cells, it's recognized as a misfolded protein and uh, degraded. On the other hand, A gap can bind to alpha subunit and uh, stabilize it. And therefore, by coincidence, we think A gap is also holding this chaperone for alpha subunit. <laughs> and next, we look at the subcellular sub localization of the protein. Uh, in the, uh, so this is the alpha subunit on the plasma membrane. You can see the puncta. But the A gap, by contrast, uh, shows a diffusive pattern. And uh, which, which is a typical of cytoplasm, which uh, leads to our hypothesis. A gap <coughs> actually regulates upstream event in AP2 adapter formation, and it does not follow AP2 adapter to the plasma membrane. Now, one prediction from the Shepard model is uh, a gap function should be independent of its location in the cell. Um, to test this possibility, we uh, tether a gap to the ER surface by fusing it to a, a ER membrane protein called ATF6. Um, and this is going to target the protein to the ER surface. So this is a Western blot. You can see uh, the fusion protein expressed at a similar level as a gap, and there was uh, no degradation. And, uh, I think it's quite uh, interestingly, we found this uh, fusion protein uh, could 
uh, to a larger degree restored transferrin receptor endocytosis. Even it's not as close as a gap rescue, but it clearly showed this ER anchored protein can function. So therefore, ER, well, a gap function is not uh, dependent on its localization, which is uh, consistent with uh, a chaperon model. Now, this is a crucial test. A crucial prediction from the Shepard model is forced expression of the alpha subunit should rescue a gap knockout phenotype. And here we took the advantage of very strong promoter, virus derived promoter. And when we overexpressed alpha subunit, it could fully rescue the trans transferrin receptor inter uh, in internalization and as good as a gap rescue. And the base subunited rescue uh, overexpression didn't work. And as expected, expression all the four AP2 subunits could rescue. So I think uh, we can draw two key conclusions from this data. The first is restoring AP2 expression artificially can bypass requirement for A gap. And uh, all these data indeed suggest A gap is a whole this chaperone. Uh, for the upper subunit. But I think uh, a gap is more than just a chaperone. Um, so I'm going to show you some data and uh, look forward to your comments. So what happens after a gap binds to upper subunit? Uh, to monitor a gap interaction with uh, uh, AP2 subunits, we develop HA tag system in which HA tag is added to all the four subunits of the AP2 uh, subunits. And you can see uh, this is sigma HA, this is mu HA. And alpha and the beta, uh, they migrate at the same location in the SDS page. OK, so here is the co-IP data. Uh, we found a gap it could pull down alpha subunit, as expected. But it could not pull down uh, the sigma subunit by itself. However, when we put in all the four subunits, a gap could pull down alpha subunit and the sigma subunit. Uh, we couldn't, uh, we never see uh, the mu subunit. And also we performed additional analysis, different co-IP design using uh, untagged version of alpha subunit. We could only see alpha and uh, sigma subunits. We never could see uh, beta or mu subunits. And if we confirm this uh, co-IP data by using a recombinant protein, so here I just want to see uh, this line. Uh, we can find, so we saw uh, the sigma subunit bind to alpha subunit and uh, AA gap. It's a very small protein, so the staining is uh, very faint, but I think uh, it's about a stoichiometric interaction. So there, therefore, the A gap alpha subunit dimer subsequently recruit the sigma subunit. So I'd like to put uh, what I talked about so far into this model. Uh, we think uh, AP2 adapter assembly is not a spontaneous process as previously assumed. Instead, it's a highly organized process. The initiator of the process is a dimer or A gap and alpha subunit. And the dimer here recruits the sigma subunit. Since beta and the mu subunits does not bind to A gap, we propose they can uh, displace a gap from the alpha and the sigma subunit, which allows the formation of the tetramer. So what happens after is well known. So the story I just told you is a prequel of uh, the story that has been told again and again. Um, and what happens without a gap? The entire AP2 assembly, assembly process uh, just collapse. All the subunits uh, got degraded. Well, in summary, um, we showed A gap is a master regulator of uh, AP2 adapter assembly. Um, in addition, as a chaperone for alpha subunit, we propose maybe A gap can prevent uh, AP2 binding to non cognate cytosolic proteins. You know, many cytosolic proteins contain the dilucine 
uh, signals, but they should not be recognized by AP2 adapters. Now, if the AP2 adapter is uh, fully formed, the beta subunit can block the binding site unless, uh, until it's opened up on the plasma membrane. Uh, but what happens before beta can mask the binding sites? And we propose a gap may be functioned by blocking the binding sites so to prevent the binding to the non coagulated proteins. Um, now, because other multimeric tra trafficking factors like AP1, AP3, COP1 face the same challenges of assembly and the specificity issues, we think uh, maybe uh, there are other A gap like molecules that control their assembly. Now, before I finish, I'd like to return to the PPK disease. Now, here is a diagram of the skin cell contact. The contact between skin cells are driven by uh, a series of membrane proteins and the cell solid proteins, uh, which include a decimal glin, uh, decimal plaquin, DP here, and uh, keratin. In interestingly, most of these proteins are also found to be mutated in the PPK disease, along with a gap. Now, the mutations of these genes make total sense because you can imagine these, their mutations are going to compromise in the integrity of the skin cell contact, and therefore cause skin disease. But how does a gap fit into the picture? So here, I just want to show you a preliminary observation. Uh, we did a proteomic analysis of a uh, surface proteins in A-gap knockout cells. And we found A-gap can mutations downregulate a protein called a decimal plaquin. So without A-gap, this protein level on the cell surface was strongly reduced. Now this is a very preliminary data. Uh, additional work needs to be done, but I think it has a potential to explain why A-gap mutations can cause uh, the skin disease. Uh, so before I wrap up, I'd like to convey the message. Um, there are still many mysteries in the mysteries in the endocytosis and the exocytosis that need to be solved. Our screen identified many membrane proteins which show the very strong knockout phenotype, but virtually nothing is known about their biologic functions. Now, if you do a sequence prediction, you still got nothing. Uh, in my opinion, moving forward, a very exciting direction is to find out how these proteins regulate cargo flow in the cell. Okay, so with that, um, I'd like to thank the people, uh, Dan, Lauren, great students, Haija, postdoc, so they did all the work I show you today. Uh, I'm going to return to this, and uh, thank you for your attention. So we have time for questions. So maybe I start with Alberto or Tommy. Do you want to start? Okay. Please. Okay. So this is very cool that you're regulating AP2 assembly. Thank you. But could you tell us why it's not lethal? Since yeah. So I know cholesterol is lethal because of the trafficking from the Golgi. It's uh, actually uh, cause more lethality. So actually, you can knock out the AP2 and they're not uh, lethal in certain cells. No, it's lethal in none. You eliminate AP2 and it's lethal in none. In cell culture? In animals, I can AP2's, understand. AP2 elimination is lethal in animals, and if you eliminate... Well, in animals, right? Yeah, animals, so for sure, yeah. Why if this is so important for the folding of AP2? Right. Uh, the only phenotype you're getting, as you said, was the PPK. Well, that's a haploid insufficiency, right? So just a one allele mutation. So now remember, I study uh, vesicle fusion protein monkey 18 for many years. Uh, Hyperloid insufficiency uh, mutation of monkey 18 one only cause certain neuronal phenotype. Overall, the patients are normal. Okay. So I think um, why skin cells are more sensitive? Uh, well, maybe some mathematical uh, modeling. I, I cannot tell. So, but overall, I don't think uh, other tissues are going to be. Uh, sensitive. Uh, and again, I agree, knockout of a AP2 in animals is going to kill the animals. But in the cell culture levels, I don't think they're essential genes. 
Well, if you don't have a B2 in cell, I mean, cells divide with no AP2. They're very sick. They uh, have problems. I mean, lots of issues, right? So uh, I think uh, you could be right. Uh, I think uh, you are right. Um, for these clonal CRISPR knockout cells, eventually we select for the mutants that can grow, right? Yeah, so it's, it could be compensation. It could, well, it's not going to be a phenotypic compensation, right? Uh, or could be a hypomorphic mutations. It reduce uh, most of the activity, but there's some residual activity that keep the cells alive. Yeah. Well, we're, uh, uh, well, when we knock out yeah. essential genes in the proteasome, yeah. the cells can grow better sometimes <laughs> in a, in a, sh in a, over a few no. weeks. No, no, but if you eliminate AP2, uh, the cells are sick as hell. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so th this actually can be, uh, this can be precisely checked. There is a essential gene list. Uh, we checked a couple years ago. We, we, I don't think these are essential genes, maybe surprisingly. At least not in the cancer well, cell lines. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there, there are several screens. Uh, well, I cannot say for normal cells, but at least in cancer cells, they are not essential genes. Yeah, it, it's a comment about the rabbi uh, story. Uh, so, um, if, I, if I understand, uh, you propose it's a chaperone if you remove it. Uh, Rab10 is degraded, Rab8 is degraded. But I'm not so sure that this excludes the fact that the real function could be something else. Uh, um, it, no, it, because yeah. it's common to find a situation in which you have a dimer in which both yeah, or yeah. two proteins have real functions. If you uh, eliminate one. Can I just sharpen yeah, this question? Yeah. Hmm? Do you check it on endogenous proteins mm -hmm. or on express proteins? Because the chaperone, it will be different. The Rep10, right? Yes. Yeah, the Rep10 is all endogenous. Okay. okay. And, and, Sorry, so <laughs> you... and also, we could uh, force express the Rep10 using a viral promoter. We restore Rep10 protein, we totally rescue mm -hmm. Rep10 knockout phenotype. So, I think your question has uh, two parts. First, I think it's uh, fairly clear in our case it's a chaperone. But does it function in another way? You know, it could be a gap. Uh, in a different pathway. <laughs> I don't think I get it, but uh, in that case, I think it's possible, yeah. It's is it completely clear that it doesn't have some, uh, I would call it real function, modulatory function on uh, the activity of RAM10, but then of course it also stabilizes RAM10 because it dimerizes with it. So in general, this is the case for, for other dimers. Uh, I think that's uh, totally possible. For example, a gap, uh, even to chaperone, but I think, uh, as I showed, it's uh, more than that. It's uh, organized the whole assembly pathway. Maybe RebF is doing that also. Stabilize Reb, but also control a downstream function. So right now, we just don't have the evidence. Yeah. So a uh, quick follow-up on this, and then I have another question. Uh, the, does it work on sec form? Sec, sec for, yeah, okay, the yeast, yeah. Well, the, the yeast, uh, I remember if you knock out a rab or a home log, you don't see anything, right? You see a little bit of effect only when you have a, a rab mutation, then you overexpress this to rescue. I think that only demonstrates those proteins interact, right? So we, we haven't tested in yeast yet, um, uh, but I think you, yeah, I don't see how you can test a function without a knockout phenotype. Right? It's kind of hard. So the, the other question was on the very last part of your, what you were saying about the phenotype. Um, I was confused how down regulation of desmoplakin would have anything to do with endocytosis. Right, so um, I, I think this is going to be an indirect effect. Um, we did a proteomics and uh, knockout A gap caused a massive uh, dispersion, uh, like, uh, how do you imbalances on the surface of proteins. So a large number of protein, either you get uh, too much or you get too less. I think it's going to be, uh, for example, maybe a cargo adapter on the plasma membrane, uh, which is uh, reduced, but in turn you get a more or another protein because of a, a lack of inhibition. So I think it's going to be really hard to interpret at this moment. We, we don't know why uh, it causes that disease, uh, just one possibility. And uh, the, 
I think it can likely can be an uh, indirect effect. Or, 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 it, or completely independent of the... Uh, uh, yeah, so in that case, I would think uh, we probably want to rescue AP2 uh, and uh, check it, right? So, yeah. Maybe be back? So, I mean, I, I, I find your phenotype, which, which has to do with cryptonocyte dysfunction. You know, you get this uh, scaly palms or oh. scaly feet. Which I mean, have you looked at... Oh, yeah, that okay. Have you looked at... Are you sure you criticize the patients? No, 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 no. <laughs> so I, I was going to ask you whether you've looked at the organization of the cells. Do they maintain cell junctions? Yeah, so uh, that's going to be a crucial experiment to study the disease. We're thinking uh, to introduce the precisely the same mutation into IPS cells and the differentiate into, into a carotinocytes. Um, I think uh, that's going to tell us uh, a lot about this protein function. I mean, th th it could very well be that your protein, um, whatever the name is, Aga, um, is doing what it's doing, and it is involved in cell cycle specific cell junction disassembly. Yeah. And that is being affected and therefore what you end up with is a cell that does not disassemble desmosomes when they have to divide and as a result what you end up with is creating a, 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 a phenotype which is like dead cell right. tumor. But, you, but you're still thinking the, the more direct cause is the endocytosis defect, right? Yeah. I agree. So what happens after AP2, we, we cannot say for sure. It's just a speculation. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we're finished with two small comment questions, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Have you checked the mutant that caused the phenotype on AP2? That's right. So uh, we, so many of the mutations actually uh, are premature terminations right around the middle and the IC terminus. We didn't have the precess mutation, but we have done uh, a truncation, which mimics the disease mutation. So that one was uh, totally inactive. So we saw endocytosis defect. So in our assay, you need uh, the entire protein. So, so you think you said that at the end, I think it's fascinating. How, how extensive it is this notion of having chaperones to help them? So folding, right? Because I mean, the same is true with HSC nine. Yeah, and so can well, you yeah, on yes. Thinking? So well, we can we can talk more, but I think uh, we're actually touching uh, even much bigger problem mm -hmm. for multiple subunits like uh, AP two or snares. You know, they are expressed at a different uh, uh, chromosome location, different promoters. How do you coordinate their assembly, right? Um, because they're expressed at different levels. Uh, I think uh, maybe this is uh, one solution for that. You have an uh, initiator from one subunit and uh, just go from there. And everything else, uh, if they're expressed more or less, it doesn't matter. They, if too much, they're gonna get degraded. Uh, if too less, they're gonna wait for initiator to get ready. So I think uh, this uh, may be a general way to assemble uh, multimeric proteins in the mammalian cells. Uh, how sensitive? Um, but at least in a gap case, it's very sensitive because without a gap, you don't get any AP2 adapters. Uh, what's your second so question? You is other substrates? Yeah, so I, we have some uh, preliminary data. Actually, AP1, the gum subunit also disappears uh, with the a gap knockout, uh, but uh, the delta adapting was normal, so AP3 was fine, but AP2 and AP1, they were affected. So... Yeah, and we can continue this in the panel discussion, if it's okay with you guys. Yeah. Yeah. So we can continue All right, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you.